This coming Sunday is Communion Sunday. We're going to practice COVID protocol. We will have the plates down here. You can come pick up your waiver and your drink at the same time. And, and we'll do it that way just because of COVID. Highest numbers ever this past weekend. I think 22,000 people. And they, and they don't know if that's accurate because they ran out of testing kits. Uh, it's, it's still amongst us. Uh, deaths were 19 Monday, I think, or today, 19 today. Uh, so anyway, it's still around us. Uh, we just trust and pray that, that our government will give us guidance and that we will be saved in all that we do. And uh, we will get to it. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. All right, you need to understand who do you think is funding the vaccinations? Uh, so that's, that's my point. Who did that run out? We've been hit guys for the last two years. I know. Well, I agree, but they did come up with the vaccination. I took it. It ain't killed me. So, you know, yeah, Trump did that. Yeah, Trump did. He got all that lined up. But they paid for it. You know, they did. So that's, why I, that's the reason I said that. So. Also, uh, in the months of all the things that we were doing, I forgot to remind you that January is also Make Your Will Month. If you have not made your will out, you need to do that because I don't see a spring chicken sitting out here. And so you get it closer to death and you need to have a health care power of attorney, uh, somebody to be in charge of your affairs. And please, don't make more of that than it really is. There's only really two hard questions that you have to answer when you consider making a health care power of attorney out, okay? It's somebody that can make decisions for you and you're not capable of making them because you're under in a calm or something. But there's only two hard questions. If you want somebody to be aggressive <clears throat> on you to bring you back to life or you decide a DNR, do not resuscitate. And that's not even the accurate word now. It's called A-N-D, allow natural death. Though that and then whether you want them to place a feeding tube in your body or you do not want them to place a feeding tube. That's basically what a health care power of attorney is. You making that decision about those two points. How aggressive do you think you want somebody to be bring you to life and whether you want a feeding tube or not. It's, it's really that simple. So everybody needs to make a will out when you die. You need to make a will out while you live. Okay? Nod your head like a billy goat. Everybody got that, right? How many of you have one? All right, so you can get up to speed on that. It, it helps your family because they're sitting there having to make decisions and trying to remember what y'all, what your loved one discussed on the supper table. Did they say they wanted this or not? So when you make the decision yourself, that takes care of it. Okay. All right, moving right along, uh, we're going to do our prayer list tonight, and then we'll have a choir practice tonight after everything is over. We have several names that we need to add, okay? First of all, let me mention Sandy Morris. She had her heart cath yesterday. She was having a lot of pain. And the doctor went in there and said, nothing has improved as far as her heart damage from her first heart attack. There's still a lot of deadness there. But there's no more blockages, okay? Everything is fairly well there. So she's doing good. I guess she's just resting tonight, okay? Uh, Millie Gill is doing very, very good. She had her surgery yesterday. She's on a up, uh, beat note. Uh, they're gonna start rehab and I'll keep you updated on everything. And I'm gonna be calling on several folks in this church to kind of help keep things moving. One thing we probably need to do is move the ramp from the back of the porch to the front of the porch because there's more access that she's gonna have to be in a wheelchair, okay? But she's up actually walking around right now. Uh, with the help, of course, of the walker. She's on one foot. But, you know, uh, so anyway, keep her in your prayers. Call her if you get an opportunity, okay? Uh, the names that you just told me about, Doc. J.J. Welch. J.J. Welch. Elaine Ashley. Brady Gottman. Those were the two that went down the prayer chain. Okay, Mr. Garvin, I don't know anything about him. He is, was, I got my phone right here. Denise is right in his hand. Why 
while she's looking, let me tell you about J.J. Welch. That is Denise Welch's younger son. He is in pretty bad shape. He's on the COVID floor at Lexington on the ventilator. And he's the same age, I think, as Trip Sykes. So he's very, very young. Uh, so let's lift him up to the Lord. <clears throat> I've already raised it, but it seemed like it was like. What about uh? Seven what about the feeder? Mary she, She's on here. She um, got COVID. Yeah, she's got COVID. <laughs> Mary Mary Del Feener is on here. She's got COVID. I don't see uh Mizell's tonight. Or how's her mama doing? Do you know anything, Felicia? You know where they are? Well, I know she's doing all right, but she's got COVID. Who has? Her mama. Her mom has COVID, so they're probably quarantined. Yeah. Help me with her name. Lena Latham. I can't remember the last name. Lena Latham. Lena Latham. Isn't that it? Lena Latham. Lena Latham. L-A-T-H-A-N. I can't remember that. She's on the list. And she has COVID. Okay, let's remember her about prayers. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I know she's in rehab, but now she has COVID, so let's lift her up to the Lord. We also have Mary Ann Hamilton. 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 Uh, we also have Miss Ann. As far as I know, she's still in the hospital, correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, her blood platelets are still like they were. Uh, <laughs> let's remember Betty's family as they go to lay her son to rest on February 4th. Uh, are y'all going to have a memorial service outdoors or in, inside? Just outdoor service? Huh? Just the graveside? And what day is the 4th of Thursday? Friday. Okay. How far is that up there? Any hours? Four hour drive. Okay. Okay. All right. Anybody else that we need to add to the prayer list? Is Cody and uh, Michael okay? They are good. They had mild symptoms for a couple of days, but they're okay. back wide. <laughs> Very good. Keep I also need to let you know that uh, Cindy Moody has taken another job. She's going to be working down in Buford, and so they will be moving out of the parsonage. Uh, they thank everybody for their help. It's been a godsend. She, uh, her and her husband said, y'all have been like family to them. They appreciated everything. And I told them to take their time, move their stuff, you know, at a leisure pace. Because there's really no reason to get it all out there. So they've actually started moving as we speak. But she'll be working at a college down there at Buford, South Carolina. Uh, so remember them if you will. Keith and Lizzie, they're COVID now. Huh? Keith and Lizzie have COVID. Both of them? Oh my word. When did he come down with it? Um, I think he tested positive Tuesday, so. He was with us Sunday. Yeah, I don't know if he tested it. I guess yesterday. Did they both get tested? I don't know. He didn't have it yesterday. He had it today. He didn't tell me if he actually got tested. Yeah. I don't even know where he can go to get testing right now. Probably Yeah. How's Harry? Harry, you okay? I'm, I'm back in it. Not you. Oh, yeah, I'm good. I'll get you in a minute. I know, Mary. What doctor tell you? He told me I got arthritis and a narrowing of the um, uh, the canal where your spinal cord is. Old age. Yep, that's about Old age. I know, I know it's going to catch up with you. <laughs> now, Harry, how you doing with your back, bro? Well, I'll find out when, uh, whenever they get, what is it, um, the seventh. The seventh. Yes. We gotta go to Dr. Rambo. The seventh. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Right. Yeah. Uh, remember to put Grady on the prayer list. Okay. Senator Grady Gartman. Yeah, we that's what we're talking about, right? Yeah. That's Blanche's grandson, which is uh, um, Robin's Robin's son. Yeah. Robin is buried out in the yard. Yeah. He died. Huh? He died. 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 He What's Janie's last name? Pat? 
Janie. 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 Janie Dickinson. Huh? Dickinson. Yeah, Dickinson. 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 All right, I was told to give a holler out to Janie. That's name right. Her last name to Janie. She's been Janie watching Dickinson. us on Facebook and tomorrow and every Sunday. And every Wednesday, I think, on Wednesday. So. And make sure you do that on Sunday. Okay, so I'll, I'll right. remember her last name and I'll have a holler out to her on Sunday. She'll know when you holler her out. All right, Janie and Caleb. Yep, and Lee. What's your son's name? There. Lee. Um, What's your last name? Jameson? Caleb's father. Yeah. Can't think of it either. No, no, not right off. Not off. You're as bad as I am. No, huh? You're as bad as I am. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> All right, any others that we need to pray for? Anybody having surgery coming up? We know we have three in the hospital. We have uh, uh, Teresa's mother, we have Ann, and we have Millie. Nobody else? Not Harry. <laughs> Nobody having surgery coming up? Okay. All right, Donna's supposed to go back to the pain management Friday. Uh, so keep her in your prayers also. She's under the same situation here under Harry. Leave now? Yeah. I know it. Yeah, I knew it. I knew it was Dickinson just as soon as you said I couldn't remember to save my life. Mm -hmm. Just bottle out Danny and me. I want to hear y'all folks pray tonight. I will close it with a word, a short word. I just like to go around the room and you collect your thoughts and you just talk to the Lord tonight about whatever God lays on your whole heart or soul. Uh, it's a reflection on the COVID, it's a reflection on the deaths around us, whatever God laid on your heart. Just uh, offer up a prayer. I'm going to start with uh, Will. We'll go all the way back and come down from Will. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to visit you and to Speak to Kenneth. Speak to each and every heart here tonight. That name we pray. Father, oh, we just give you thanks for each and every day you give us on And I'm praying for the ones that are on my prayer list. I'm going to lift them up that you might deal with them in your situation.
thank you, Lord, for being with us. Thank you for so abundantly blessing us. Watch over me and Harry. Watch over our loved ones who are in need of prayer and healing. Take care of those. Take care of Millie. Take care of Sheila and Sandra and all her family and all of our church members who are going through some hard times with losing family and and just just sickness and illness and Anne being sick and just watch over us all, Lord. We know you do. We know you love us. We we thank you for that. We, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and all that you do for us and continue to be with us and be with all of us through the rest of this week and in Jesus' precious holy name. Dear Father, we thank you for the blessings that you have stowed upon us today and for in the past. My dear Father, we pray for those who are sick. We know there are many in our church family and others outside that are going through COVID and surgery and other situations. And we just pray that your hand be placed upon them and heal them in accordance with your will. And we just thank you for everything that you do for us in giving your son. Father God, I pray to you to resolve the, the situation over in, over, in the, over in Russia, Father. Dear for Russia and Ukraine. Father, it's on the eve, it's on a path of war. And Father, we know that you can resolve this issue with these two nations. Father, we hate to see the bloodshed that's going to be over there because we know that it's going to be able to eventually evolve us and it can affect the United States and the Eastern nation, Father. Father, I ask you to help them resolve that issue. It's closed, Father. And we can hold them in and pray. Father, we do love and pray, Lord. Oh, we got so many problems that's going on around us and as I said in this country, Lord, and oh we don't we, we wouldn't know what to do, but we know if you do and we put them in your hands and now Lord it's come up to about uh, the Supreme Court. Lord I ask you to please have them pick one Lord that Lord is conservative and to look at you before making decisions. Lord, if you like if our president would do that, Lord, everything would be all right. And we just ask you, Lord, to help him make the right decision. We pray for Grady's family, Lord, and pray for Blanche because they're having a hard time right now. Lord, we just love you, praise you, and ask you to forgive us our many shortcomings. We ask you in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for me being able to still be able to write, have a pen and pencil, because Lord, just things like lately my mind just gets so confused that I just can't seem to remember things like I once did. But I'm capable of writing these notes to myself. And sometimes it's these little simple things that we forget to thank you for. And I want to thank you for that. And Lord, I just pray that you will continue to help Christy to improve and in her life that she will come close to you, Lord. And I pray for our dear friend that we lost just recently, Sarah Williamson in Bristol, and her family. I pray for her family now. She was such a blessing to be around. To be with, she served you all for many years. Give us a good evening now, I pray in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight, praise you in the name, Lord. And as your children, Lord, the Word tells us that we are to go out and to minister and to witness to those around us. And sometimes that witness might be just lending an ear. Sometimes people that are dealing with deaths, with illnesses, with financial strains. They just need someone that they can talk to. You have to be able to just
just to listen and let them talk and let them know that you're their father. Lord, uh, there's so many people that are so stressed in all that's going on in this world now. Let us be that ear that's willing to listen and willing to pray and to let them know that they're not alone, that they have you and they have us to help them get through the crisis that are going on in their life. In Jesus' name I pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you tonight asking for mercy and forgiveness, Lord, and sin and a blessing in listening to the prayers of the people. If it delights me, Lord, I know it delights you also. You promised to hear our prayers, Lord, if we pray with a clean heart. The only way to have a clean heart is to confess our and forsake our sins. So hear our prayers from God. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. to the book of Ruth tonight, the book of Ruth chapter 2. This is such a short book, but it's so full of so many things. Ruth is the eighth book, and it's the new beginning for the people of God. It is the end of the period of judges. And it goes into the period of Samuel. And Samuel is probably the one writing the book of Ruth. And it's a new opportunity for God's people to be reintroduced to God's love and God's mercy and God's grace. Ruth is all about the first Gentile to be redeemed. Ruth is all about the first Gentile in the lineage of Jesus Christ. It's the first fulfillment of Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, not just Jews. It's the first fulfillment of Acts 2, 21. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, for all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so we know that Ruth became redeemed. How do we know that? Well, it says it right here in verse one, or chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God shall be my God. That's kind of a consolatory prayer there. Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to be part of you. I'm going to be part of your people. And, God, and Naomi, whatever God you serve will be the God that I serve. And so that begins, or at least fulfills, the, the, the redemption process in our life. Ruth is also proof of Acts 13, that God has added to the body of Christ, not only Jews, but also Gentiles. In the first chapter, we were introduced to the characters. 
we saw Naomi, the mother-in-law, who married a Moabite. We saw Ruth, who found salvation because she recognized the God of Naomi as being the true God. We saw and was introduced to Oprah, who made the choice to return to the life of the Moabites. And then in chapter 2, we introduced to the kinsman redeemer, which was Boaz. Now, when they leave Moabite, the Moab and the land of the Moabites, they are leaving a tremendously wicked people. So wicked that the Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy that none of the mammoth Ammonites or the Moabites will be allowed in the house of God for the tenth generation. And as David pointed out, I guess he had a commentary or Google it or something. It was there. And he knew that 700 years. Now that's how <coughs> angry that God was with the Moabites, that he would not allow them into his presence for 10 generations. As we look at some of the characters of the story, we learn some tremendous lessons. Naomi teaches us about five or six lessons. Uh, she acknowledges that she has nothing to offer except her friendship. She acknowledges that she is childless and she will have no more sons. She confesses her hopeless condition and says she is doomed and she is wasted. Then she philosophizes that the daughter should not go with her because I cannot ever give you anybody else to marry, so you'll never have a man as long as you stay with me. Okay, but God's going to take care of that. <clears throat> and the fifth thing is the most idle. She blames God for her condition. That is the case of every backslider. When somebody backslides on God, the first thing they do is point the finger at God. God... You're the reason that I'm in this situation. And they become bitter and they become blind. And then the telltale sign of her backslid is this. They all get old before their time, and so she did also. Then there's some lessons we learned from Oprah before we leave her. Oprah teaches us that it's possible to go a long way with believers and never be saved. It's also possible for all of her affection to be forgotten, as was hers. She's kind of like Judas, who kissed Jesus, but it didn't profit him anything. And the third lesson we learned, that she never leaves her childhood gods. No matter how far she trotted toward the promised land, the gods of the Moabites were still in her heart. Like the chief god of Chemos, who had that belly, kept burning by the priest, and children were sacrificed every day, especially girl children, female children, thrown in that belly to appease the God and make sure he would help them win battles, make sure he would give them good crops, and then make sure that his land, their land would be at peace. So here's a child, here's a child. She went back to that. She went back to that. But they did find two Hebrew boys. But they weren't no better than Naomi. You know why? Because they went outside of God's providence, God's promise to find a mate. They violated a very important principle in Christian living or godly living as such as it's here. They violated the principle, do not become unequally yoked. Okay? I saw a sign that I was reading Facebook a while ago that... Uh, the kind of, I don't know if it was a church sign or what, but it, but it, I, I, I reposted and I think we ought to put that on our sign out there. And it simply says, unless it's his diaper, honey, you ain't never going to change him. <laughs> but you know, we'll try. We'll try. We're going to be that one. Change the ways. But to no way. They didn't change. They didn't change. When you're unequally yoked, you're unequally yoked. Well, Oprah's tears couldn't save her. She cried, but they didn't save her. Oprah's kiss couldn't save her. She kissed Naomi, but her affection couldn't save her. And then Naomi and Ruth both wept together. You see, they had hope together, finding a better life. They had loved together because they loved inside the same family. Now they cried together, but they both went different directions. Ruth took the way of life, and Oprah took the way of death. So we say goodbye to a couple of these characters. 
But as you look at these, always remember, especially when you read the Old Testament, Paul told us this is true. I can't remember the scripture, but it's there. Old Testament lessons are types. They're types. They're pictures that you and I can relate to and learn as far as New Testament truth go. Okay? Well, what did we learn? Well, we learned from Oprah that she was a professor but not a possessor. She professed faith in God, but she did not possess faith. We learn from Elimelech that he was a picture of the type of the nation of Israel. He lived in the land, but he was unfaithful and he was disobedient. Now, Naomi was also a type and a picture of Israel. Okay? She had went away from her homeland, and all she received was sorrow upon sorrow and sorrow, but she finally returned to her God, which the Bible says Israel will. Then there's the picture of Boaz, and he's the one that eclipses everything in the story. He was a type of Christ. He is the Lord of the harvest. That picture's Christ. He was the Redeemer, and he becomes the bridegroom of Ruth. And then Ruth, of course, she was a type of the picture of a bride. The poor, penniless bride, like you and I, that becomes rich because of who we marry. Amen. We have nothing, but once we enter God's we're in a relationship with the God of all heaven, we have everything. We're kings and we're queens and we're princes and we have everything at our disposal. Then there was Oprah, who was a type also. She was a type of a worldly person. She comes to the borders of the promised land, almost in, and then she turns and walks away. Now, with all that said, I want to read a few verses in chapter 2, and let's talk about it. Uh, I should read all of it, but I think I'm just going to read through verses 1 through 17. Uh, and Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of wealth and of the family, Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find what? Grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hat was to light on a part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the kinsman of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. They answered him, The Lord bless thee. Now these are righteous people. Then said Boaz unto his servant, that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? The servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued even from the morning, even unto now, that she tarried a little in the house. Now, how many of you know what's going on here? I'm going to tell you in a minute. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou, my daughter, go, go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens, lest thine eyes be on the field that they do reap. And go thou after them, and have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Then, said, then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why hast thou found grace in thine eyes? That's a phrase again. Finding grace in the eyes of Boaz, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing that I am a stranger. I come from a different land. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It has fully been showed me. Now who showed it to him? God. All that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thy husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity, and are come into a people which thou knewest not hereunto, or heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, unto whose wings thou art come to trust. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for thou hast comforted me, and thou hast spoken friendly unto thy handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thy handmaidens. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime, come thou thither and eat of my bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached his parched corn, 
And she did eat and was toughest and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean, leap even among the sheaves, and reproach her not, lest fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field of the evening, and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephod, an ephah of barley. So in chapter 2, in the verses that we just read, Ruth meets Boaz. The two widows had arrived in Bethlehem. According to Micah chapter 5, verse 2, Bethlehem is the tiniest and probably the poorest town in the region. But it's surrounded by all kinds of part, uh, 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 wheat fields, harvest fields. Okay, This is going to be the place of Ruth. It is going to be the place of Boaz, his birthplace. He says so. It's going to be the birthplace of David, and it's going to be the birthplace of Jesus. To prove that, all you got to do is read the last two verses of Ruth chapter 4. Verse 21 and 22. And Salmon begot Boaz, Boaz begot Obed, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. And we know from the New Testament scriptures that out of the lineage of David came the Lord Jesus Christ. So right there you have the lineage of Jesus Christ. Okay? Well, a conversation is struck up. Naomi and Ruth have arrived at the poor little town of Bethlehem. And Ruth asked her a question. They said, well, we're here, but where are we? I mean, this is such a tiny place. We are with us. We have no land to take care of us. How are we going to eat? How are we going to make a living? What are we going to do? And Naomi's answer to her is this. Well, you may not know it, but Israel, our nation of Israel, has a social security system. You didn't know that, did you? Go with me right quick to Leviticus 23-22. This is Israel's social security system. Leviticus 23, 22. And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field. When thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. And I am the Lord your God. That was God's social security program. That's how God decided to take care of the poor. The rich people harvested the ground, but God has specifically said, do not touch the corners because the corners belong to the poor people. They can come behind you and don't even go back and backtrack and try to pick up the rings that you have harvested. Leave it on the ground. And the poor people can come and they can get the harvest left in the corners and they can pick up any that you have left on the ground and that's how the poor shall live. And that was God's social security system. That those that had it was going to take care of those who didn't. And he provided. Now with one catch to this, every one of them had to work. I mean you couldn't stick your house, you had to go out in the field and you had to harvest if you wanted to get something that God had left for you. But he specifically said that if you had something it didn't belong to you that the corners belonged to God. What he said. Specifically said that in the book of Leviticus. And so then the providence of God takes over. Boaz is the kinsman, okay? He needs servants to come and harvest his field. He specifically gives a command that you do exactly as the Bible says. You are to leave some for these poor people that are coming behind you. Well, Ruth happens to be one of those poor people, and she's standing there, and uh, she's looking around, and she said, where am I going? I'm in the middle of the streets of Bethlehem. The sun's about to come up, and I see a lot of people that has fields, and I see a lot of harvesters. I don't know which direction to go. That's where the divine providence of God comes in. She can't see, but she's going to trust God to lead her in the direction that she goes in. And it just so happened that the providence of God is going to lead her to the field of a man by the name of Boaz. And so she's a sinking soul. 
And the seeking soul of God sends the sovereignty of God into work to bring her to a place where she can be redeemed. Friends, I declare to you that the book of Ruth is evidence that there's nobody in the world that died without a witness. Nobody. She was from a foreign land, but God her brought her to the place where she could find salvation. And God does that on every island of the globe. He sends salvation to every her human being. And he sent salvation to her. Okay? So, she comes and all of a sudden she's following Boaz's army or weepers, whatever you call it. Okay? Boaz sees her. He says, you're a stranger. I don't know much about you, but you're welcome. There some, must have been something in Boaz's eye that kind of light, uh, brought a light into to a root to him. And so they meet and verse 10 of chapter 2 tells the story. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said to him, Why have I found grace in your eyes that you should take knowledge of me even though I am a stranger? Man, that's a, that's, a, that's a prayer that you and I could talk to God about. God, why have you decided to look upon me and give me the grace? Why of all the hundreds of thousands of people in the world, Lord, have you reached your hand down to save me? Why of all the people in the world that you could have chosen, you chose me to be a preacher of the gospel? Why of all the people on God's creation have you picked me to be a receiver of your grace and mercy? Amen? Amen. And that's what happened. That's exactly what happened. So the sovereignty of God directs her footsteps. And he, as he's directing her footsteps, she finds the grace of God. And so the story is told. We will look again at chapter 3. We'll look again at chapter 4. But here's how it plays out. First of all, in chapter 2, she goes into Boaz's fields, okay? Chapter 3, she's at Boaz's feet. And then in chapter 4, she is part of Boaz's family. Now, relate that to New Testament salvation, okay? Here you and I come, you know, we just thought we'd come and heard, hear the music, maybe to be entertained. We came to church, but all of a sudden while we're in the fields of God, sitting there, there's something said or sang or prayed that God pricks our heart, and we understand that we're a sinner, that we need God. And out of the field, out of the hundreds that's sitting in the pews, God pricked your heart. Okay? He chose you out of the fields. What's your response? You come and you kneel at the foot of the Lord Jesus Christ as he hangs up on the cross of Calvary. And you cry out under mercy for God, uh, to God, and guess what? Because of that prayer, God, you are my God. These are my people. God puts you in his family. Amen. And brothers and sisters, I want you to know there's no stronger bond on God's creation than being a part of the family of God. You think of the broken family units around the world, around Orangeburg, around this church. Units that really aren't cohesive. Husbands, wives, children, grandchildren, grandparents that go all their different ways and some of them have no communication with them whatsoever. But buddy, there is a bond in the family of Providence Baptist Church where you say I do and you become a member of the Lord's family here at Providence. You have the strongest bond that you will ever have in God's creation. You have people that will support you. You have people that will pray for you. and You have people that will lift you up in every situation. That's a strong bond. And don't ever take it for granted. Don't ever take that for granted. So Boaz becomes a kinsman. He's rich. And he becomes merciful to the poor servant that had nothing but gets everything because of a relationship to the kinsman. All right, that's chapter 2. Any questions? No questions? Well, we're doing good. We'll look at her relationship to Boaz as she gets to sit at his feet next time. Okay?